It's that time again, so welcome back to Signals to Danger, this time for episode 14. Um, we do a little bit of introduction every time, so whether this is your first episode or your 14th, welcome along, really very happy to have you. Please continue to like and share and review the podcast, and remember, if social media is your thing, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at, at Signals to Danger, or me personally at, at Daniel Fox Rail. I've also recently updated the YouTube page for this podcast and my intention is to start to create a little bit of additional content on there in the future. A few days ago I uploaded a short video that I filmed when I visited Great Heck earlier this week. If you've listened before you'll know I'm on Patreon and that means I want to say a special thank you to the new patrons who've signed up since last time, Roy and Stuart. Please welcome to Team Signals. Not sure why I said please, probably not the... uh, Right context for that, but anyway, thank you and welcome to Team Signals. Now, if you sign up to Patreon, you get some extra content such as exclusive Q&As and there is more of that sort of stuff to come. So if it sounds interesting to you, please visit patreon.com forward slash signals to danger. For those of you out there who want to experience a slightly more lighthearted railway podcast, can I suggest Steam and Steel? Matt, one of my listeners, has recently set up this podcast where he interviews the men and women who keep the heritage railways up and down the country running. You might even hear my dulcet tones on there one day. With all of that out of the way, it is now time to move on to episode 14. The wind whistled and the driving rain hung in the night air above the Cumbrian foothills. The stillness of the remote location was drowned out by the sound of search and rescue helicopters hovering above. Their searchlights and thermal imaging cameras pointed down to the scene below. Eleven carriages of a high-speed passenger train lay there, jackknifed down an embankment, with carriages laying on their sides. The year is 2007, and these helicopters were flying over Grey Rig. People are known to have died. Carriages are crushed one on top of another. One lies metres away and appears partially burned. The railway industry is tonight coming to terms with yet another disaster. This is Signals to Danger, a podcast where we look at major rail disasters which have occurred in the UK explain what happened, how the investigation was carried out, and how each of these accidents shaped the industry going forwards. I'm Dan, I work within the rail industry in my day-to-day life, but today I'll be the one taking you through this podcast. If you're a regular listener, you will know that I had a uh, bit of a tough time with the old voice and throat two weeks ago. Uh, It's not entirely back yet, but I'm hoping you'll hear that it is a lot better. So we'll kick off this episode, as ever, by putting some context on the time of the accident. This year is 2007. The 17th of March saw the reopening of the rebuilt Wembley Stadium, six years after its predecessor closed down. The 27th of June saw the resignation of Tony Blair as Prime Minister, succeeded by Gordon Brown and three days later, and saw an attempted terror attack on Glasgow Airport. A jeep was driven into the doors of the building and caught fire. A defining memory of the attack was a, well, a kick to the groin of one of the attackers by John Smeaton, a baggage handler at the airport, who rapidly became an everyman hero. July saw the implementation of the smoking ban, which means we all finally got to see what our pubs actually smelt like, and I've never been quite sure that that was a good thing. In railway news, the 30th of March saw Network Rail, in its position as rail track successor, handed down a £4 million fine for the health and safety failings which had led to the Ladbroke Grove rail crash. And the 14th of November saw the opening of High Speed 1, or the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. A busy year all round, but this story takes place at the leading end of it, on February the 23rd. At quarter past five in the evening on the 23rd of February, a train left London's Euston station. 
One of the capital's main terminus stations, Houston, forms the tip of the West Coast Main Line. If this sounds familiar, you're right it is. We've visited the WCML before in a previous episode. The one that covered the derailment at Nuneaton in 1975. The line, as I explained then, runs all the way from the capital, northwest towards Milton Keynes, then to Rugby, before it splits out to Birmingham and Nuneaton. Continuing northbound, the line calls at Stafford, and then two branches go on to Crewe and to Stoke. Terminating spurs at Liverpool and Manchester come next, and then the line continues north to Preston and Lancaster. Between Rugby and Preston, the line isn't as, well, linear and simple as its East Coast counterpart. Go and have a look at the map if my lumbering description didn't quite make sense. I know I did while I was writing this bit. However, north of the Manchester area, it does get a lot simpler. The line runs up from Preston to Lancaster and then through what I think is one of the most scenic bits of railway in the country, the Loon Gorge. This is where the line runs alongside the M6 motorway and up through the edge of the Lake District. The line then continues on up to Carlisle before crossing the border into Scotland. Passing through the town of Lockerbie, a place with its own tragic history, the line splits at Carstairs, with the final branches heading out to both Glasgow and Edinburgh. The train that left London at 17.15 on the 23rd was a Virgin train service, 1 Sierra 83. The train was booked to run the full journey from the capital all the way north to the Scottish city of Glasgow. City of Glasgow, coincidentally, was the name given to 390-033, the nine-vehicle-long electric multiple unit operating the service. Capable of a design speed of 140 mile an hour, these trains regularly run at up to 125 as they traverse the line, but speed is not really their defining feature. The 390s are known by the name Pendolino. They use an active tilt system to lean into corners, allowing them to take the tighter corners of the West Coast Main Line at higher speeds than a non-tilting train could. These trains were introduced in 2002, replacing locomotive hauled services, but the concept wasn't new. In the 70s and 80s, British Rail had done massive amounts of work on the concept of tilting trains and, as a result, created the advanced passenger train. Well, for various reasons, the ATP did not take off and the project died a death, leaving the Italians to pick up the research and finally develop the production versions, hence the very Italian name. Now, I could, and I might at some point do a good 30 minutes or so on why this is a very disappointing saga, and the the failings that was the fizzling out of the ATP project, but I will hold back from that now. It's not what we're here to talk about today. Let's get back to the episode. One Sierra 83 was a routine and problem-free journey as far north as Preston. Well, there was some flooding in the kitchen area of the rearmost vehicle, but that was more of an inconvenience than anything else. Upon arrival into Preston, the train was met by a replacement train crew. A train manager and driver were booked to take the train northbound, having travelled south on an earlier service. The driver, Ian Black, was based at Glasgow and had been working these trains for the last two years. With driver Black at the controls and three other members of train crew and 105 passengers in the nine carriages behind, the train left Preston at 1940 and headed north into the foothills of the Lake District. The West Coast Main Line, especially through its northern section, passes through some beautiful but remote countryside. Sweeping curves and frequent earthworks, viaducts, cuttings, embankments and overbridges litter the route and Sierra 83 negotiated them all as it proceeded onwards. As the train approached Oxenholm, the mainline station which serves the Lake District, Black reduced his speed for the 90 mile an hour restriction through the station and after the lights of the platforms had whipped past, he increased the speed of the train to 95 and set the speed set function which would hold the train there. After the West Coast Main Line passes Oxenholm, it makes two turns of almost 90 degrees to bring it back in line with the M6 motorway, and the northbound run up the Loon Gorge as far as Tibet. The first to the right, and then after the line has run east for a short while, the second to the left, and north again. This is where 1 Sierra 83 was now, taking the right-hand curve at 95 miles an hour, 
and heading out along the eastbound section, rapidly approaching the village of Greyrig, just to the north of the line. At this point, the train, travelling through the cold, wet evening, began to derail, suddenly and violently. Sat in the cab of the leading carriage right at the very front end of Sierra 83, Ian Black was involved in this crash before he knew what was happening. As the derailment began, the forces at the front end were not insignificant. In these early stages, well, he, he gave an account to the media later on, which said this. First, I was forced into the upright position. The train leapt into the air. You do get bumps and wee noises on trains, but I knew, immediately, without a shadow of a doubt, I was in big bother. The train leapt into the air and came down pretty solid. I remember noise of the ballast, stones underneath the train, hitting really loud and hitting line-side equipment. My impression was that I had veered off the line. The fact was that he had no time to react to what was happening before he was thrown from his seat upwards, his head forcefully colliding with the ceiling of the cab. During the course of the next few moments, he was also propelled over the console and into the windscreen of the train. He lost consciousness at some point during the crash and didn't come round until after everything had stopped moving. What he didn't know was what fate had come to the nine carriage train that he was in control of. The leading carriage, Coach A, where Black had been sat, was laid at the bottom of an embankment with the track up above it. It was on its side, pointing back along the line to London. There was severe damage to the underframe equipment defamation to the floor in places and damage to the body side on the left side of the vehicle. The next carriage, Coach B, lay around three carriage lengths further down the line, almost perpendicular to the direction of travel, pointing up the embankment, while its trailing end was at the bottom. The upper projected out above the tracks. The right-hand side of the carriage pointing to the sky was virtually unscathed, but the left was pushed in and deformed slightly in the middle and severely scored from sliding along the ballast. Both ends of this carriage had also deformed somewhat due to the forces of the collision. The next three carriages, C, D and E, lay in line at the foot of the embankment, also on their left-hand sides. They had suffered superficial damage, scratches, dents, scrapes, and the next three, again, were derailed but more or less upright, but they formed a loose zigzag shape along the top half of the embankment back up to track level. The last vehicle, the other driving vehicle, stood on the track bed, upright but fully derailed. In a matter of seconds, a 95 mile an hour passenger service had become scattered across an embankment in the cold, wet night. All 223 metres of the train had left the rails, and now silence replaced the noise of 72 wheels running along the rails. It was clear to everyone on the train that a disaster had taken place, but perhaps none more so than Ian Black, the driver of 1 Sierra 83. During the course of the crash, he had been thrown around brutally. His position at the front of the train had given him little protection from the forces involved. When he regained consciousness, he became quickly aware that he had been injured in the course of the accident, and not in a small way. When he came to, he was unable to reach the controls or the communication systems of the train, but he knew that he needed to make sure that he raised the alarm. Some of the worst accidents on the UK rail network, Harrow and Wealdstone, Clapham Junction, have been made that way because additional trains have crashed into the wreckage of another. He knew that his train had crashed, but apart from that, he didn't know anything else. It was pitch black, he didn't know exactly where he was, and more importantly... He couldn't move. So he did the only thing he could do. He reached into his pocket for the only bit of communication equipment that he could reach, his personal mobile phone. He will have turned it on, and uh, the report into the accident describes what he did next in the uh, factual, clear, concise manner that is so important and characteristic of these documents. It tells us that he called an off-duty employee of Virgin Trains, whose number was programmed into his phone, 
to relay a message to Virgin Trains Operations Control to arrange for trains to be stopped on the upline. What he actually did was phone Jan. Jan was another member of staff who worked for Virgin, but the reason his number was programmed into the phone, the reason she was in there, was because she was his partner. While I was researching this episode, I had a conversation with my better half. How would she feel to receive that phone call? Black later recounted how that phone call went. He was lying in the cab with head injuries, what later transpired to be a broken neck, and fading in and out of consciousness, with a woman who was later to become his wife shouting down the phone to him to wake up. In a 2017 article from the BBC, he told how eventually he had stayed on the line for around two and a half hours altogether, and he said that at times I'd go quiet, and she thought I'd died, and she found that hard to get over. I must say I can sympathise with how I'd feel to receive that phone call. I think I'd find it hard to get over as well. So Black wasn't the only person on board who tried to raise the alarm. The train manager, who had been travelling in the very rear vehicle, was abundantly aware that things had gone wrong. He tried to make his way through the train, but he couldn't even get to the next carriage because the doors were jammed. He contacted Virgin's control room, but he was unable to tell them how bad the damage was, how many injured people there were. He was on his own in the rearmost vehicle, a vehicle that had no passengers in because of the earlier leaking. However, in the next carriage ahead, a customer service manager had been moving through the train with the the catering trolley. He managed to communicate with the train manager, with them shouting through the blocked gangway door to each other, and the customer service manager made his way forward, reassuring passengers along the way, although he couldn't get any further than Coach F due to the mess the train was in. Further ahead still, in Coach C, a customer service assistant had been working in the train's shop. Severely injured themselves, they called the emergency services on their own phone. By the time they were off that phone call, passengers were starting to escape the train. She helped them and made her way down a ladder which a local resident had brought to the scene. In fact, truth be told, several passengers on the train also called the emergency services, as well as a couple of local residents. The pitch black night and remote location continued to add a level of confusion to the incident. Despite the fact that train crew had tried to stop traffic by calling the emergency services, the damage caused by the crash had actually protected the line itself. Overhead line equipment masts, supporting the cables which supply the trains with electricity, had been knocked down by the accident, and in addition, track had been damaged and track circuits broken. Cabling for the signals was cut. So, the signals that protected this section failed to danger automatically. This meant that the next southbound train, 1 Mike 99, had been brought to a stand by a normal signal sequence. Green, double yellow, yellow, red. We have covered that before, but for all intents and purposes, he knew he was being brought to a stand at a signal further down the line and continued through the signals until he reached the red one. He ended up stopping about 350 metres north of the accident site. In a similar way, the next northbound train was pulled up three miles back along the line, There was, thankfully, no danger of Sierra 83 being hit by other services. And this failing safe was really, really good, and the damaged cables turning the signals back to red was a positive, and it probably saved lives. You know, you don't know unless the the bad things happen, but there was a negative side effect. Upon receiving the first emergency calls, Cumbria Police and Cumbria Fire and Rescue Service contacted Network Rail's operations control team in Manchester. But at that point, Network Rail was unable to confirm the actual location of 1 Sierra 83. This was because all signal indications had been lost between Oxenholm and T-Bay. The screens in the control room which showed where trains were had become useless without all the equipment in place. And Oxenholm to T-Bay? Well... That's 13 miles of remote track, most of it located within the Loon Gorge. Cumbria Police and the local fire and rescue services were the first elements of the emergency services to respond, followed shortly by British Transport Police, although they were coming from Preston. 
The respective controls mobilised them all to the vicinity of Greyrig Cottage, although they couldn't provide a precise location. Because of the high volume of emergency communications taking place, all the emergency services had difficulty in locating the actual accident site. So, well, an uncoordinated search of the line from roads between Oxenholm and Tebay commenced with emergency service vehicles driving up and down roads that ran near to the railway. Eventually, one fire crew found the southbound train, 1999, the one that was 350 metres north of the crash site, but it was out of sight of it due to the curvature of the line. The train driver on that service told the crew that his train was not involved and that the site was likely to be forward of him towards Oxenholm. Unfortunately, Cumbria Police overlooked the significance of one particular call made by a local resident at around about 17 minutes past 8, 10 minutes after the crash took place. This resident gave his address and postcode, which are normally a decent way of finding a location. As it stands, that 2046, the first ambulance and fire crew from nearby Kendall, located 1 Sierra 83. Once that location was radioed back, other appliances and services congregated immediately to the east of the accident site, and after around 35 minutes, the rescue could begin in force. It was quickly established that the scale of the accident and its location meant that additional resources were certainly required. In addition to your traditional blue light services, six mountain rescue teams from all across the lakes were mobilised, as well as a cave rescue team from Yorkshire. The police also requested search and rescue assistance from the RAF, and four helicopters were mobilised in addition to Merseyside's own force helicopter. And finally, well, it might sound a little bit Thunderbirds, but International Rescue also self-mobilised to the scene. Now, they certainly didn't arrive in rockets or spaceships. They are a volunteer organisation whose members specialise in urban search and rescue, and they provide their services free of charge with uh, a focus on saving lives. Over the next few hours, the rescue continued, with Driver Black being the last to be rescued from his cab. Of the 110 people on board, 54 of the passengers and two of the train crew were taken to hospital. 18 of those were transferred by air, the remaining 38 by road. 35 passengers and two crew members sorry, were treated by medical staff at the field triage and released. Despite the devastation, the speed of the accident and the forces involved, the toll of this accident was not as severe as, well, any passing glance at the wreckage might have you believe. But it was not without any fatalities. One of the 18 people airlifted to hospital passed away en route. 84-year-old Margaret Masson, who had been travelling to Glasgow with her daughter and son-in-law just hours earlier, was the sole casualty of the disaster at Greyrig. Greyrig was the first major accident in a few years, the last being the collision with a car and derailment at Ufton Nervous in November of 2004. As ever, obtaining a full understanding of the circumstances was key, so alongside rescuers and railwaymen, the RAIB entered the picture shortly after the accident took place. Their goal was, as ever, to impartially investigate the accident. Without apportioning blame, they would set out to identify the immediate cause and any causal or contributory factors. The main question that needed answering was, first and foremost, what was the immediate cause, the actual reason that 1 Sierra 83 ended up scattered over an embankment in Cumbria? That was key, but during the course of the investigation, they would also look into the survivability of the accident, the crashworthiness of the vehicles, that sort of thing. 
And finally, they would also look at what recommendations needed to be made to prevent a reoccurrence in the future. If you've listened to this podcast before, you will be more than aware of the process of elimination that I use when trains derail, the factors that could have caused them, and how the investigators reached their conclusions. So it's time to apply this to the tracks just south of Greyrig Village. The first potential cause would be excessive curvature as a contributory factor. If you remember earlier in the episode, I described that the line makes a few almost right-hand turns here, first to the right and then to the left. However, I feel the need to stress that this kink in the line is a relatively small one when compared to the distances actually involved in the line. Between those two corners is around a four and a half mile section of a gently undulating track which eases east to west. The line does curve here, but not an unmanageable amount and especially considering that the maximum permissible speed was 95 miles an hour. You couple that with the enhanced cornering ability of the Class 390 Pendolinos and their active tilt system, it's it's not really going to be the cause as they lean into the corners, but it's worth noting that it does lead us into the next question. If the permissible speed was 95 miles an hour, then we should ask what was Sierra 83's speed in relation to that. We know that at Morpeth on the East Coast Main Line, which we covered in a previous episode, excessive speed was to blame. Well, actually, on several occasions at Morpeth, to be fair, excessive speed was to blame. No accusation was levelled against the driver at this point. It was just important to make sure to eliminate the factor. Well, by now, in 2007, we have access to something that investigators would have found incredibly useful in previous years the ODTR. ODTRs, or the on-train data recorders, are for all intents and purposes black boxes. They are known by a few names depending on what company or fleet and OTMRs, event recorders. There's probably names out there that uh, I've never heard of, but what they do is the same. They record important pieces of data about the operation of train controls and performance in response to those controls and other train control systems which is a bit of a mouthful, but they record a lot. You can tell a lot about what a train was doing by going back and viewing the data from an ODTR. The UK requirements for the minimum factors to be recorded is actually fairly lengthy. I will not read out the entire list for you, but they do include the brake demand, including operation of all brake controls, all brake activations, what the power notch selection of the train is, any operation of the AWS or other safety systems, any manual override of safety systems and use of the horn. And definitely one other that I've purposefully missed off that list, which is of specific relevance after a derailment. Speed. Both the physical speed of the wheels and the signal which is said to the speedometer in the cab. On this occasion, the OTDR recorded that after leaving Oxenholm, Black engaged the speed set system in the cab, a form of cruise control, which would hold the terrain at a specific speed, and demanded 95 miles an hour from it, the correct speed for the enhanced permissible speed that the tilting system allowed his train to travel at. So, speed wasn't a factor, and Black had driven the train through the section correctly. The untrained data recorder also provided some extra information for the investigators, One other potential cause of the derailment was whether the train had malfunctioned in some way, perhaps the tilting system or something else. Well, the parameters that were recorded on the ODTR covered much of them. The tilt system was set up and working correctly, and there was no malfunctions on other critical systems. In fact, none of the messages recorded by the train systems up to this point indicated the train had any fault which could have caused or contributed to the derailment. Which led investigators to something they look at whenever a derailment occurs. The track. Do you recall when we discussed the 2002 incident at Potter's Bar? In that investigation, the accident was focused early on a crossover south of the station. And Ealing, in 1979, a set of points just before the wreckage there came under heavy scrutiny. And this is because the joining, splitting or intersection of tracks were all very, very safe carries more of a risk than a straight, unbroken rail. 
These sets of points, crossovers and associated components can all be described under the collective term S and C, switches and crossings. So it's not really that surprising that the track layout at Greyrig came under some scrutiny. Generally, there aren't a particularly large number of points on open sections of main lines. They tend to be one line up, one line down, and you only really need complex track layouts or junctions where there are stations or where lines split and join. Because of this, the West Coast Main Line has quite long sections where it's just double track, just unbroken, no real junctions. However, if you recall my description of diversionary routes in the Summit Tunnel episode, you'll know that the railway loves a contingency. Sometimes when one line becomes unavailable due to a defect or a failed train, it might be desirable to run trains the wrong way. So for example, an up train on the down line. In the business, we call this running bang road. Well, officially it's called a wrong direction movement, but I prefer the slang in this case. In order to facilitate this, there is a requirement to provide a means of crossing over from one line to the other, so a crossover. However, the lack of use these specific crossovers would receive means that they don't necessarily need to be controllable from signalling centres or operating centres. They're quite often controlled by a local ground frame, by a member of staff sent to site specifically for the purpose of operating the crossover. Now this type of crossover is known as an emergency crossover. And it just so happens that a little to the west of where 1 Sierra 83 lay was Lambrig Emergency Crossover. A set of four points allowing trains to cross from either the up to the down or vice versa. The points were controlled by the corresponding Lambrig ground frame which was located at the site of an old level crossing where the, the cutting turned into an embankment. This one little bit of level track, level ground on that section. It is understandable that investigators started to pay close attention to these points, particularly the facing points leading into the crossover from the downline over to the upline. Two Bravo points. In fact, these points proved so interesting to them that following the photography, measurements and forensic evidence gathering, the entire switch was cut and lifted out and transported to a secure laboratory for further assessment. The reason for this? Not everything was well with two Bravo points. To explain what was wrong, we could do with briefly revisiting the makeup of a set of points. We have covered it in previous episodes, so I'm really not going to overdo it. Points work by physically moving rails to redirect the trains. The fixed rails that head either straight on or off to the side are known as the stock rails, and the two moving rails, which almost bridge the gap between the stock rails, are known as the switch rails. These moving switch rails must be kept the same distance apart in gauge to allow trains to traverse the junction safely. To make sure that this is the case, two or three bars run between the rails and hold them in gauge and they're known as stretcher bars. If you wanted a little bit more detail on that and you haven't listened to the episode on Potter's Bar, go back and have a listen to that one after this. Um, it does go into a little bit more detail. It discusses things like the final drive, which helps to move the the points in unison but you don't need necessarily all that right now what we do need to do is have a look at what two bravo points looked like immediately following the accident and it was pretty bad as it happened the first stretcher bar designed to hold the tips or the toes of the switch rail in gauge disconnected to the left hand rail three bolts were missing which should have held that connection the next stretcher bar, the second and the middle one, missing entirely. This left just one stretcher bar across the entire length of the switch rails to hold those switch rails in gauge. The third and the final one furthest away from the toes. Which is grand except this one was fractured as well. So this left hand switch rail was partially open. It was able to move independently of the right. And that was clearly a very bad state of play because there was some bruising to the very tip of that rail and deformation to the left hand rails just beyond the switch. This indicated that the tip of that switch rail had been struck by wheels as they passed. And that should never happen. 
After all the investigation and the experiments were carried out, it was proven that the free left-hand switch rail, no longer anchored to the right, had partially closed against the stock rail. And this meant that either the leading or trailing bogey of the first carriage of 1CR83 had been guided onto the left-hand switch rail accidentally, while the right-hand wheels continued straight on the right-hand switch rail. What this meant was that the two rails the wheels were travelling on were now getting closer together into a reducing gauge, or a squeezing gauge. And this squeezing gauge led to the wheel flanges climbing out of the rails and derailing. The movement of the left-hand switch which initiated the gauge narrowing had occurred either under the preceding train or under the leading bogey of 1C area 3 without a derailment taking place. But at the very minimum, when the trailing bogey of the leading vehicle of 1C area 3 got into that switch, it very much derailed. Investigators were able to ascertain, due to the marks on the components of these points, that at least four wheel sets had derailed at the switches. 95 mile an hour, the outcome of this was always going to be catastrophic. And that answered the first and most important question, what was the immediate cause? However, it does throw in two fairly significant follow-up questions. What had led to the points being in this state, and how could it have been prevented? As part of their investigation, the RAIB was able to show how the points degraded to the degree that they found themselves on the 23rd, and specifically what order those stretcher bars had failed. Instrumental in this research was the records of the various measurement trains which assessed the infrastructure on the UK rail network. Two examples that were there in 2007 were the structure gauging train and the new measurement train. On the 12th of February, the structure gauging train recorded a wheel clearance, which indicated that the third stretcher bar was not providing any restraint to the left-hand switch rail, so that bar must have fractured by that point. In addition to this, photographs taken by the new measurement train on the 21st of February 2007 showed that the second permanent way stretcher bar was missing, and the minimum free wheel clearance was 16mm. This was two days before the accident. And it is clear, looking back at that footage and those photographs, that these points were far away from the condition that they should be in. As each component of the switch failed, it placed additional strain on the others. The strain placed on each, com each part increased exponentially as the others were removed from the equation. With the third stretcher bar gone, the second received more strain. With both of them gone, the strain on the first bar was overly high, and although the emergency crossover was rarely used, 60 trains a day travelled over it, the majority of them at 95 miles an hour. It's clear that at some point between the 21st and the evening of the 23rd, that strain became too great and the stretcher bars at the tour failed as well. Understanding the failure process was an important part of understanding grey rig, but now they needed to understand how that problem hadn't been spotted at some point before it became lethal. We now know that the new measurement train and the structure gauging train gathered evidence that something was wrong, and this was prior to the accident taking place, so shouldn't this have prevented the accident? In the event that every single frame of the camera footage received scrutiny and it was checked in sequence by a qualified engineer with a sample image to compare them to, yeah, it probably would have done. They could have looked at the reference image, seen the complete stretcher bars and free wheel clearance and noted a change in conditions from February 2007. But it's important that we manage expectations here. The new measurement train measures many things, and it takes in a great variety of data for various factors. And yeah, it does film the track as it passes, and evidence of the damage was on that footage. But in the words of a Network Rail spokesman after the inquiry, it, well, he describes the issues best. 
The train runs at speeds of up to 125 mile an hour or 95 mile an hour on this particular stretch. There would be no point somebody watching it at that speed as they wouldn't be able to pick up any faults. It has to be run in super slow motion to spot faults. The train runs for up to 18 hours a day, 7 days a week. It would probably take somebody most of a month to watch one day's worth of data. It's not what it's there for. It is a backwards reference tool. And he's right. Every four weeks, the new measurement train begins its cycle again, traversing a vast proportion of the mainline railway in the UK. To watch that footage, every inch of it, it's not feasible. It's like trying to get somebody to watch all the footage uploaded to YouTube every day. The frustrating point is that I got that quote from an article entitled Rail Chiefs Never Watched Broken Rail Vid. So... It appears that uh, the point he was making might have been lost in the spirit of a good inflammatory headline. There was, however, one opportunity to prevent the accident. Physical inspections of the track. Each part of the track requires a weekly inspection, and this inspection was designed to spot any failures or issues at a far more local level and a human level than the measurement train. The section between Oxenholm and Lambrig formed one such inspection section, Section H. Track walkers from Carnforth Depot were supposed to walk this five and a half mile section once per week, but they didn't have much choice about when this took place. It had to be on a Sunday morning. Various access restrictions existed on the network, with criteria meaning that track walking was done under either green zone working or red zone working. And... There is, to be fair, there was a whole appendix of the Grey Rig report which is dedicated to this specific issue, so I'm not going to get bogged down in it. The most important thing to know is that when the speed of the West Coast Main Line was raised for tilting trains to what is called the EPS, the Enhanced Permissible Speed, these enhanced speeds increased the signal sighting distance required. So the sighting distance for trains required and it resulted in an increase in red zone restrictions from 25% to 86% of the route. Faster trains need to be seen from further away, and the West Coast Main Line is, well, bendy. The result was that a lot of the track walks then needed to coincide with under-engineering works, and be done during daylight. And I have, honestly, I've condensed this down by a lot, but by this point... Track walking could only take place between first light and around 10.30am on a Sunday morning. This requirement placed a vast amount of pressure on rostering teams and built an inherent reliance on overtime to get the entirety of this section of the West Coast Main Line inspected every week. All of this combined and culminated in the morning of the 18th of February. To get around the manpower issues, a track section supervisor booked into the area that morning to carry out a supervisor's inspection of some recent works, had agreed that he would also carry out the patrol of Section H. This particular engineer had often been working 50 to 60 hour weeks to keep on top of his workload, and it appears that on this morning, he might have become stretched a little too thin. He commenced his inspection midway between Oxenholm and Lambrig, and walked northwards to go in inspect a specific section of the track that had recently been repaired before returning south to Oxenholm. But because of where he stopped before he turned south again, a 1,500-yard section of track was not inspected on Sunday the 18th of February 2007. The track section manager stated that after the derailment in the course of the week, he'd forgotten that he'd agreed to carry out Inspection H, as well as his own inspection. What we do know is that on the 21st, at least one of the stretcher bars was clearly missing, and that on the 23rd, that left-hand switch rail was uncontrolled. If the supervisor had remembered to go and check those points, there was a very real potential that Greyrig would never have taken place. What I would like to stress at this point is it really wasn't his fault. His section was horrifically overworked and understaffed, and 60-hour weeks proved that. The decrease of available time to inspect the track was clearly unsustainable. The problem was that proof of that fact was going to come in a terrible form.
Moving on to the second question, the survivability of the crash. The RAIB tackled this in a very pragmatic manner. They identified the injuries sustained during the course of the accident and the ways that they had been inflicted. While 58 received minor injuries, we almost expect them in an accident of this scale. What was more crucial was to gain an understanding of the injuries sustained by the 28 passengers and two crew who received injuries that were defined as serious. And moving into this section, I will say that I entirely and comprehensively praise the crashworthiness of the Class 390. Yep, 30 people received serious injuries and there was one tragic fatality, but that was all. And I really don't mean to downplay it when I say that, but this is a situation where a 95 mile an hour passenger train was violently thrown off the track and down an embankment into a field. We have covered accidents on this podcast where far lower speeds have led to far more deaths. We will cover some in the future where that difference comes in a three figure number. This performance was recognised by the REIB and they pointed out some of the benefits offered by the train in their report. The Pendolino had laminated windows, which really didn't break easily at all. And with the exception of two people, nobody was ejected from the vehicles. We know that this has been a cause of loss of life in the past. The strength of the couplers were praised for keeping the train more or less in line. Virtually all of the vehicles were still connected, which prevented overriding, jackknifing. It will have limited the free rotation that could have occurred as the carriages left the track. On top of this, the sheer strength of the body shell was noted. At Hatfield, the overhead line masts practically destroyed the buffet car of an Intercity 225. But here at Greyrig, the lead vehicle had collided with a number of them as it rotated across the tracks. None had penetrated the saloon. The strength of the carriage, keeping them out. There were a few negative points raised, though in the second vehicle, the defamation to the body side had led to a number of seats becoming detached within the saloon, and a number of panels had detached from the ceilings as well. Just the fixings that kept them closed were overpowered by the accelerations in there, and a number of passengers with head injuries had sustained them from the panels colliding with them. But when all the investigation was concluded, it became clear that the majority of the serious injuries were received when passengers were thrown around the interior of the train. And this was probably inevitable, considering the the path the train took, its speed. It certainly led to the broken neck of Mr Black and the other injuries sustained by the passengers. The last thing to be written in the report were the recommendations, and there were a great many of them, as is often the case. 29, to be precise, in this case. The first, angled at Network Rail, addressed the design of stretcher bars at points, particularly that the design should be improved to prevent the failures that we saw at Greyrick. 2, 3, 4 and 5, they were also pointed at Network Rail, directing them to improve their inspection regime of switches and crossings, and 6 to 10 were more recommendations for specific training at Network Rail. 11 was interesting. Network Rail should modify its processes to specify the following safeguards when a supervisor's visual track inspection is combined with a basic visual inspection. This recommendation meant that a check would need to be carried out by a person other than the relevant supervisor to confirm that both inspections have been completed and recorded appropriately. Had this been in place, then the forgotten inspection of Section H would have been flagged up quickly. Well, like I said earlier, there are 29 recommendations, and I certainly won't go through all of them. But 17 is relevant to one of the things that we said earlier, instructing Network Rail to review and, if necessary, revise its access arrangements and plans for its mainline routes. This would hopefully mitigate the Sunday morning patrol problem. The vast, vast majority of recommendations were levelled at Network Rail, and rightfully so. Although the RIB doesn't apportion blame, it clearly showed that the failings had been in their ability to maintain the asset, or rather more crucially, a failing to find the fault before it became an accident. To 
to say that Grey Rig carried with it echoes of Potter's Bar would be an understatement. Five years had elapsed since a broken stretcher bar on facing points had caused a high-speed derailment, this time on the outskirts of the capital, but the memories hadn't faded. While the investigations into the accidents at both Potter's Bar and Hatfield had served as a scathing indictment of rail tracks outsourcing of maintenance and inspections, Greyrig highlighted how the shiny new network rail hadn't been able to entirely shake off the issues that workload and access restrictions created. By the time that the RAIB report was published, several actions had already been taken in response to the accident at Greyrig. Following the accident, Network Rail issued a special inspection notice, and I'll read out the, uh, the name of it because you know I like a long letters and numbers abbreviation, NR-SIN-097, which led to the examination of 1,437 sets of points. The examinations focused on stretcher bars, stretcher bar fasteners, freewheel clearance, and track gauge. Well, none of them were as bad as two Bravo points at Lambrig, but there were some failures found. Network Rail also reviewed traffic patterns on the West Coast Main Line, and they decided that the railway could be operated adequately without the Lambrig crossovers. They, along with a number of other emergency crossovers, were subsequently removed. In, in health and safety parlance there is a an abbreviation eric which tells you risk controls it's an, and i can never remember it but i always remember that the e in eric is eliminate the first option for a risk control is if you can remove the risk do that and if you don't have points to maintain there's not a risk that they fail and cause an accident eliminate they they also did a great deal of work around the redesign of stretcher bars and their fitment and this was in advance of the formal recommendations to do that all of this good work however was not enough to absolve network rail of the failings in 2012 they were fined four million pounds for the health and safety failings which led to the accident the office of rail regulation now the Office of Rail and Road, had taken the decision to prosecute them after the coroner's inquest had found that the poor maintenance of two Bravo points was to blame for the accident. I feel like there's not really much ambiguity about that at this stage. Ian Prosser, the Director of Railway Safety at the Regulator, had said that the derailment near Grey Rig was a devastating and preventable incident which had long-term consequences for all involved. It tragically caused the death of Mrs. Mason and shattered the lives of others. My thoughts are with Mrs. Mason's family and all those injured and affected by this horrific incident. Network Rail is focused on driving safety measures and I welcome the company's progress on implementing safety recommendations made after this incident. But the pace of carrying out improvements has at times been too slow and the rail regulator has had to repeatedly push the company to bring about change. The tragic death of Margaret Masson was avoidable and truly sad to those whose lives she touched. But her name carried a certain prominence in the world of instant investigation for some time afterwards. Not because she was the sole fatality to result from this multi-million pound piece of machinery being scattered like a toy, but because she was the last passenger to be killed on Britain's railways. Articles commemorating the 10th anniversary of the crash three years ago refer to her as the last person killed on the railway. It's a testament to safety culture and the efforts of the industry to react to learnings. Unfortunately, the title isn't one that Mrs. Masson kept forever. She did, for 13 years, 5 months and 18 days. It was true, she was the last person killed on the railway, last passenger killed on the railway. But that was only until an unfortunate day last summer, when a Scott Rail service derailed over a landslip at Carmen, near Stonehaven. We may never completely eliminate these dark days, but a continued culture of thorough investigation and accountability will help us keep them as far apart 
as possible. Thank you for tuning in to episode 14. I am sorry it's about a day later than all of you were expecting it. Once again, please like, share, review, come interact with us on social media, Twitter or Facebook. If you are interested in supporting us, please do go and have a look at our Patreon. It's patreon.com signals to danger. And for those of you who've listened all the way to the end, I want to tell you now that you can get hold of a new t-shirt or hoodie if you get yourself over to the shop page at signals to danger.com got a new supplier they're a little bit cheaper i've even got myself one that i'll be modeling in videos etc going forwards but until next episode travel safe